point to our final conversation tonight. We're focusing on prosecution of graft. There's been scandal after another. But at the end of the day, the question everyone is asking is why are we not seeing people being held to account? We saw NYS1, 23 of those suspects have since been released. No evidence was found to hold them accountable on the charges that are raised at the time. Joining me in studio now is Steve Ogola. He's an advocate. We're meant to also have Tom Ogenda, senior counsel and JSC member. However, he's caught up in traffic coming from out of town. So uh, our apologies, his apologies have been received by the show. Thank you for being here, uh, uh, Steve. At least 50 people we've seen have been charged over this fresh scandal at the NYS. And skeptics are saying, same script, different cost. We'll go through the motions, there'll be charges, our year, two, three, and they'll all be released. What do you think is the problem with our system? I think it's the fear. First of all, we must contextualize the war on graft uh, before we can then look at, interrogate the strategies right. and why those strategies are failing, if at all. Now, the context is this. Graft is occurring in the context of structured impunity, in the sense that in this country, adherence to the rule of law is not as binding as we may want to believe. Uh, there is selective compliance with the law by state officers mm -hmm. and other public officers, you know, in the civil service are taking cue, you know. So if you want to look at corruption, you must look at it in that context that people know that they can offend the law without mm -hmm. accountability. Mm -hmm. Now, because of, because of that reassurance that there's low accountability rate, it means that everybody in government is co-opted into the philosophy of primitive accumulation of wealth in the right. first place and right. in the second place being co-opted into that club of resource managers that you can then reallocate to your own people, to yourself and your cronies, and then also along the chain so that it's not possible to isolate, to, to say the buck stops here. Yeah. Because in terms of tracking, almost every scandal that happens in this country, the, un the undisclosed or the unshared information mm -hmm. is that there are people in the background that are well aware. Because if you look at the law, we have a robust legal infrastructure. Yeah. Look at the Constitution, look at the Public Officer Ethics Act, look at the Leadership and Integrity Act, you look at the, uh, the Public Officer Code, uh, Code of Conduct and mm -hmm. Ethics and the Leadership and Integrity Codes of Conduct. All this robust legal framework, plus the criminal law, you know, the penal code and other applicable laws, yeah. should be able to instill some level of fresh train or even fear, if you like, that with this, with this kind of robust legal infrastructure, the disincentives, plus the vetting that happens when these people are appointed, mm. the, disincent the disincentives are many. Yet corruption has only deepened and widened. If you look at Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, puts Kenya at number 143 out of 186 countries assessed. Yeah. It tells you that corruption is pervasive. So it's so a culture of corruption? You must understand it with? in that context so that you can then Put the con apply the law in the, how the law can be applied in the context of structured impunity. Mm. Now, another aspect that, that has gone unattended, all of these are very, uh, very important aspects for us to know the, the success rates of, in the war against graft. Mm -hmm. Now, corruption is best fought at the ballot. Mm -hmm. Corruption is best fought at the ballot because the people have an opportunity to organize the people that, the, the governance at the ballot in terms of selecting people that they believe are of integrity. Right. Social vetting mechanisms are so weak in this country. People vote based on ethnic persuasion, euphoria, and such other things without necessarily interrogating the kind of people they want to put there. Mm -hmm. If you look at IBC spending limits, by way of example, gave, although those spending limits were, were, were suspended, but the spending limits published by IBC gave presidential candidates up to five billion you know, to campaign, you can, you, can, you can inject up to five billion, money which is not disclosed where you're getting it from. And these candidates also have up to 15 billion from their political parties. Yeah. So for, by way of demonstration, Uhura and Raila could as well amass 20 billion each, you know, to, to, to mount- Just to run the campaign. To mount, within the law, to, to mount a presidential campaign. What is the salary of a president? He earns about two million per month. That's about, that's about 24 million in a year, that's mm -hmm. about 100 million mm -hmm. in five years, but has he been allowed to inject 5 billion in his campaign and 15 billion from the party? So are you saying in it's a, a shrink, lost cause? In a shrinking economy, you yeah. must contextualize where is this money coming from? The possibility of injecting illegal money, you know, 
black money, and then after formation of government, the philosophy of recouping that money mm. will then be entrenched. So that if you want to fight corruption, as you now want to discuss this, the next steps, <laughs> you must get it in, in this proper context. Because now where we are, I like the signal sent by the president. He's spoken tough, you know, and there seems to be decisive action. But mm -hmm. remember, the president, he said his legacy is very tough on talk. Uh, but the actions have been, have been low in terms of results. So if you look at how to fight corruption, like the cases that are now pending before court. Right. I am not aware and I'm not sure if the government has what you may consider corruption risk assessment tool. Because if you had that, it would break down instances of corruption. If, other than just targeting the procurement officers, mm. when you're sending out a notice for tender, has it been sent within the 21 days that is provided for by law? Or is it sent less, just a week to the deadline? Because that already is a signal. Mm -hmm. If you're sending it, you know, just a short, a few days to the, to close, to, uh, to the close of the deadline, it means that a significant number of people will be excluded from applying. Okay. Then the people that sit down, so that, that's already a signal. It should, right. it should have been curbed at that point, not post the fact. All right. I you want get. To, yeah. I want us to listen to what President Kenyatta uh, had to say. You said his staff on talk, but in far as actions, well, mm. he's proposed a new cause of action. Let's listen. As an initial step, all heads of procurement and accounts in government ministries, departments, agencies, and parastatos will undergo fresh vetting, including polygraph testing, to determine their integrity and suitability. Those who shall fail the vetting will stand suspended. Fresh vetting, polygraph tests, there are legal concerns that have been raised by some on this. Do you share those concerns? Of course, there are legal concerns because this is the constitutional applicable law. We have constitutional control mechanism mm -hmm. to protect people from witch hunt. So if you look at the law as it is now and vis a vis what the president is saying, you see obvious challenges. Unless the law is renovated to accommodate what he's proposing, the obvious challenges are this. You know, obviously, the presumption of innocence. How are you identifying people to be subject to the polygraph test? Is it voluntary? Is it compulsory? He has said all now, government yes, officers. Yes, yes. So, so if you say, if yeah. you say, it's, if you say it's compulsory, what about people that don't wish to participate? Are they going to be condemned and heard? What does it mean in terms of victimization? Fired. Again, what, what is the question about unfair, unfair discrimination? Because as I've said, mm. if you had a corruption risk assessment tool, it would map out key processes where vulnerabilities lie and key personnel that are likely to be more susceptible to corrupt practices. So it may not be as easy as the president may want us to believe that you target cleanup of procurement officers and then you leave the top guys. Every key step in the procurement process has certain vul internal vulnerabilities. And if they are mapped and you, you track it every step of the way, the moment the tender is issued, we would not be making late discoveries about scandals post the fact, mm -hmm. once they've occurred, you'd know where the weaknesses lie. So if you target, you know, you bring that argument, then vis-a-vis -vis targeting only procurement officers, obviously the question of unfair discrimination comes in. I see a possibility of the court injuncting that process. Again, also in terms of prudent and parsimonious application of resources, in other countries like the US that use this polygraph test, they are manufactured there. So the cost of probably, the cost is probably lower. Mm. How can we say with certainty and evidence that we have exhausted opportunities to innovate within the law that now we need to go to, to you know, lie detectors as the, yeah. as the only remedial measure? And there's only one month to go. There's only one month to go. I think, I understand the frustration, but this polygraph test will run into serious legal challenges okay. and it may not see the light of day yeah. because of what I've already highlighted. Mm. Because again, what is the implication or the impact of people you know, if you're found to have lied, the machine detects you, and then let's say you are sacked on that ground, your ability for future employment, are, the nuances around this issue may not be as plain or as simple as okay. the president may want us to believe. Yeah. I think we need to re-strategize. For me, what I hear him saying, the, the global picture, there is a need now mm -hmm. to re-strategize and people with options should then volunteer those options. And I'm already volunteering one. Mm -hmm. Every line ministry should have corruption risk assessment tools, breaking it and communicating to the public. You see, corruption deepens and widens 
where there is opaqueness in operation. Mm -hmm. The critical stakeholders in that sector, because every corruption has sectoral players, yeah. people with a detailed understanding of, that, of that, how that area works. Right. Talk about the May scandal, talk about NYS. There are people that, service providers in that area. Okay. If there is information sharing, proactive information sharing, we have an Access to Information Act mm. that brings in all stakeholders, not just people who are interested in tendering, okay. but people that may be interested in potential tendering in the future, and they know. And all these actions are, 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 are transacted openly yeah. in a verifiable manner. It will reduce opportunities for corruption or for manipulation of the system. Okay. Some people are confident and optimistic that a new DCI and DPP are just what this fight needs. Do you share that enthusiasm with the appointments? Well, I'm obliged to take it with caution. I, I take that the, the new vigor. I think the, the, uh, the director of public prosecution has, has assumed office with, with a lot of zeal and zest. We wish him well, but I'm sure he's also acutely aware of the challenges that are structured, which he faces. For instance, if you target the top, the top personnel, you know, and you hound them in court, the lawyers are going to raise procedural issues. Are you sure that when you bring the CEO here, that is in the, it's actually the one in charge of receiving, making tenders and receiving them, by the time he makes approval, there's a presumption in law that public officers under him acted in good faith. Yeah. So if he's going to interrogate, to stall the process, and interrogate afresh every single person, then there will be no procurement going on. If you bring that argument in court, you can see clearly, Sophia, that this people will be let go. I mean, the conviction will be assured. Yeah. What, what, what I hear this process now achieving is that in terms of public communication of decisiveness or exasperation, in terms of we are tired with corruption and we are doing something, mm -hmm. that's a good PR exercise. But whether it can deliver results, the ODP must answer this because, you know, again, mm. before he takes people to court, he's, he has an independent office that is not supposed to respond to political pressure, be it from the executive or elsewhere. Right. He operates independently, and part of the independence around his office is sound prosecutorial judgment. Mm. Can he tell us with, with certainty and evidence that within the time when the president spoke and the time when this part being arraigned in court, that he's been able to amass evidence yes. in a very complex and sophisticated public right. sector corruption. Yeah. Does he have that evidence? Well, he has expressed that uh, confidence. Or he has taken it, them to court yeah. to take the pressure off the president's back. So these are the questions we must interrogate yeah. and find answers to. But is it a positive move because it has been announced there will also be interrogation uh, and investigations on graft within the ODPP, because one of the biggest concerns has been that the fight against graft is held hostage by those involved in investigation, that they themselves are the most corrupt. So is that a good sign? Well, I, I wouldn't say it's a good or a bad sign because people have accused the ODPP, they've accused the police for short investigation. They have, at times they've accused the judiciary for letting crooks go, yes. but judiciary works on evidence adduced if there's no evidence. They've accused lawyers of conniving, you know, with, with corrupt people okay. to try and, you know. But you see, you see, the thing is this. For all these role players, other than the investigative agencies, the police, the ESCC, the ODPP, that now that, that's the prosecution. The judiciary and the lawyers, you see, judiciary, they work on evidence adduced. They may really want to, I, in fact, I listened with a lot of uh, concern, the chief justice giving commitments that he cannot deliver. You know, you, you can, he doesn't need to say that we are with you in the war on corruption. Mm -hmm. Of course, the judiciary is permanently with, the, with Kenyans on the war on corruption. Right. But if there is no evidence, in as much as Maraga wants to be with the people in the own corruption, no person will be convicted. It's a question of evidence, okay. tendering incontrovertible evidence. Again, for lawyers, and I've seen some bashing about lawyers representing crooks, and they're saying lawyers shouldn't. You see, the mind of a criminal defense lawyer is that no one is to accuse himself except before the Lord. Mm. If you come to me and you say you want legal representation, mine is to walk you through the judicial process and make sure that he who accuses you okay. establishes the case. All right. On, on the other hand, the DPP has said that uh, in terms of employees and capacity, he's had high turnover in the Office of the, ODP, office of the yes. Director of Public Prosecutions. Yes. So capacity is a challenge. They're not attracting good quality uh, people who will stay. They'll come and move on to other more lucrative jobs. And at the same time, EACC, the Miscellaneous Amendment Bill 2018, proposing to strip it of investigative powers. What do this kind of things... What story do they tell, in your view? I think that's a good innovation by the ODPP in the sense that I had the director say that they're going to rely more on senior counsel who are more mm -hmm. experienced in litigation. They know the nuances about around, around litigation, around mm -hmm. these kind of cases, rather than picking maybe fresh lawyers who may are grappling with serious cases, complex in nature, 
that they may not understand. That kind of critical support is necessary. But remember, once you hold that office, you're not allowed to transfer the blame. You apply yourself fully. The critical challenges I've said right now is the structured impunity that people think, I was, I was reviewing the law. Mm. This issue of foreign opening comp proxy companies, the law disallows it. The Public Officers Ethics Act, Section 9 and Section 11 and, and Section 10, requires, in terms of application of those offices, you can't, you're not required to manipulate that office. But you know, officers do this. They manipulate the officers, they register yeah. companies, because they know there's a level of protection beyond those offices. Okay. So how is the ODP prepared to unmask all this? Mm. Investigations that will bring results are the ones that are more detailed all right. and more carefully crafted mm -hmm. and implemented than these remedial measures that now we have. This, uh, maybe some media house or journalist, yeah. investigative journalist, has revealed a mega scandal. Okay. And to deal with the pressure, you take the top guys and then All you right. hand them in court. We are out of time, but thank you. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. making time for us. Steve Ogola, advocate, um, giving his suggestion and proposal for what can be done to ensure we perhaps see fruit being born on this war against grafters, we like to call it. And you're watching Checkpoint. Stay with us. When we return, my colleague Robinson Okenya will be taking you through the sports news and giving you updates of what transpired in the last...